So as I said, we're finishing up a series called Joyful, and uh, in this series, we've been going through the book of Philippians. Each week, we've looked at a section, a passage of Scripture there, and today we're going to finish up in Philippians chapter 4 with the concluding verses of this letter. And all through the letter, there's been this theme, this repetitious theme of joy, of living a joyful life. And today we're going to be talking about how to add one more characteristic. We've looked at six different characteristics already. We're going to look at one more this week. A characteristic we need to apply to our lives to live out daily so that we can enjoy life as God intended us to enjoy life. Before I get to it, though, I wanted to share this with you. I think there are quite a few of us in the room that have a disease. It's spreading. Lots of people are infected with it. And many of them don't even realize that they have it. And I hate to be the one to break it to you, but I think it's true that many of us in the room have contracted this disease. Maybe you're sensing already that there's something wrong. Maybe not. Sometimes it's not evident until later on. In the early stages, it's hard to detect this disease. So I want to help you. Sometimes, I, you know, if you're talking generalities, it's hard to identify, but I want to give you some specifics to look at to help you diagnose whether or not you have this disease, some specific symptoms to look for. With this disease, it's possible for a man to walk into his garage and see a car that's only a few years old that runs perfectly well and still think he needs to go buy another car. With this disease, it's quite possible for a woman to walk into a closet. I didn't say stand out and look at a closet. Walk into a closet, be surrounded by clothes, and think, I don't have a thing to wear. It is possible with this disease that you could look in the mirror and never like what you see. That you look in the mirror and you think things like this. Why did I get my mom's thighs? Or in my kid's case, why did I get my dad's nose? You know, whatever it is. Something you just don't like about yourself. This disease can cause people to look at their spouse and think, I might have, could have done better. Uh, if I'd married this person, my life might have been better than it is now. If I'd married that person, if I just waited to get married, didn't get married at all, life might have been better. This disease is... I believe, a contributing factor to a lot of divorces in America. I know it contributes to a lot of the consumer debt in our country. More and more people are just struggling financially. Maybe they're making as much or more than they've ever made, but they're still struggling because they owe so much in debt. And it's just, they're drowning in it. This disease... It's tricky. It can make you think that there's some way that you could just be totally content with life if you just had a little more of whatever it is you think you need more of. If you have this disease, it's really important that you not go to your friend's new house when they invite you to come over to see it. Because if you walk into this house and they've got stuff you've always wanted but you don't have, it's going to make this disease flare up again. They've got granite countertops. You've always wanted that. You don't have it. They've got a beautiful staircase. You've always wanted a house with a beautiful staircase. Now your friend has one and you don't. They've got a finished basement. You've got a basement you've been saying for 15 years you were going to finish. Theirs is already built out completely finished. And believe me, you better not, if you're struggling with this disease, go to Home Depot or Lowe's. Because you will contribute even more greatly to the consumer debt problem. Thinking you've got to get some stuff and do some projects because you can't be content with what you have now. I don't know if any of these symptoms describe you. I think I can relate to a few. There is this disease known as discontentment. That's what it is. Discontentment. It's an epidemic in our culture today. 
and our Western civilization, with all of our advantages and privileges, we are some of the most discontent people who've ever lived on the planet anytime, anywhere. It's amazing how tricky this disease is, how deceptive it is. And on top of that, we try to treat this disease by self-medicating it. This year, as a country, we will spend over a billion dollars in prescription drugs to try to make us feel better about ourselves and our lives. To try to have some sense of inner peace and contentment. People will turn to alcohol and drugs, pornography, even food, to try to make themselves feel better about themselves. To somehow find a moment of contentment. And I can relate to it. I can understand it. Because here's the thing about discontentment. It'll rob you of your joy. It always robs you of your joy. We're talking week after week after week through the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi about living a joyful life. Well, if anything can keep you from living a joyful life, it's this disease of discontentment. It will keep you from having the joy that God wants you to have. But here's the question. The key question for the day is, is there a cure? Is there some cure for this disease so that we can experience the joy? Is there some secret to finding contentment in our lives? Well, that's exactly what Paul's going to be talking about in the passage we're looking at today. If you've got your Bibles, open up Philippians chapter 4 on your smartphone or tablet, however you look up your verses there. We'll put them on the screen as well. Philippians 4, I want to begin with verse 12 here. Paul says this, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. Did you catch that? I've learned a secret of being content. Now this is cool. Paul is saying, I know something that, that a lot of people don't know. That's why he calls it a secret, okay? It's obvious that a lot of people don't know it because we're living so discontentedly in our culture. So a lot of people don't know this. So this is a valuable secret. And Paul says, I know the secret. But he says, I've learned the secret. You see, that's what I want you to understand to begin with today is this. Contentment is something you have to learn. It doesn't come naturally. I don't think to anybody. I don't think it's just our nature to stay content very long on our own. And in our culture, we have so much being uh, thrown our way all the time to keep us from being content that it's certainly not easy to just naturally feel contented all the time. So we have to understand it's a learned thing. This secret doesn't just come to everybody. It's not just natural for everybody. We are not by nature content people. In fact, I think we contract this disease of discontentment really early on in life. Any of you have a baby right now that you've got in the home, a baby in the home? Yeah, i got a few. Any of you remember having a baby at home? Yeah. Here's what I know about having a baby in the house. They don't stay content very long, do they? I mean, you might feed them, change the diaper, and think, okay, I've got them all set now for a while. I can relax for a little while because the baby will certainly be content now that it's fed and changed. And for a little while, sometimes they are. But how long does that last? Not real long, right? It's not long until the diaper's wet again. It's not long until the baby wants to be fed again. If the rocking chair has stopped, they want to be rocked again. If the car has parked in the driveway, instead of you feel the motion of the car, they're crying and screaming again You just after you got them asleep. You know they don't stay content very long. So this starts early. This starts really early in our lives, this lack of contentment. We're not satisfied with what we have for very long at all. Well, Robert Hastings writes about it this way. He says that we should picture life like, us, uh, like we're riding on a train ride. Imagine yourself going on this long journey on a train and outside the window there are fields of corn and rolling hillsides and city skylines. But you don't really notice those things on this train because you're absolutely focused on getting to the station. In your mind, you've decided that the station is the place where you'll find fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness. So you walk up and down the aisles of the train, looking at your watch, wishing the train would go faster, because if you could just get to the station, everything would be good. 
Here's what Hastings says. He says, the name of the train is more and the name of the station is contentment. We think this will get us there. When I get to the station, then I'll be content. Then I'll be happy. When I just turn 16 and get my driver's license. When I get my degree and graduate. When I have enough money to buy the car. When I lose the weight. When I find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. When we get the kids raised and out of the house. When we can retire comfortably. When, when, when we get to the station. Then we'll be content. We'll be happy. The train is called more, and it's always headed to a station called contentment. But it never seems to get there. Is that the secret Paul is talking about? That the way to find contentment is just to get more of whatever it is we want? Because this is the message that's communicated to us by our culture constantly. We are bombarded by messages that remind us of things we don't have. If you watch any television at all, they can't have 15 minutes of a show without stopping every 10 to 15 minutes to remind you of something you don't have that they think you ought to have. And they try to tell you that you can't be content until you get it. But if you do get it, then you'll be content. You listen to the radio very long, almost any station. They can't play a song or two without giving you another commercial about something else you need to have. You can't drive down the road without billboard after billboard announcing to you something else you need in your life so that you could be content. I could tell you there are times when I struggle with it more than other times. I'll share with you a time that it hits me often, more often than at other times. It's when I'm flying somewhere. I'm getting on a plane. Now, you have to realize how cheap I am. I, uh, I don't like to pay extra for anything. And so oftentimes, if, if they have a flight available, I almost always fly Southwest. And you know, Southwest doesn't have any first class section or anything. But they have now incorporated into their plan, if you would pay about $15 extra each way, you could get in this list to board first and get your choice of all the seats in the plane. You can sit anywhere you want, but it costs you more money to be the first one to get in there to get the seat that you want. I'm not paying $15 extra. I'm not going to do that. So what I end up doing is I end up being boarded with a late after a lot of people have already gotten the seats. I like aisle seats. I like to be near the front in an aisle seat. You get in and out faster that way. Uh, you, you could get seated quicker. And, and I like that, but almost never do I get that because I won't pay the extra to do it, right? So I just stay frustrated and discontented. Now, one time on another airline that has first class, I got the economy seat. But when I was boarding and getting checked in, they said, sir, we have a first-class upgrade available. Would you like to have it? I said, yeah. I got to sit up there. The seats are bigger. They're wider. Got big old padded armrests. They come by and offer you actual food and drink and stuff. And, you know, not the little pack of peanuts, but real stuff, you know. And, and they, they treat you so well. And I got to sit there and watch the other people go by that weren't in first class. You poor souls, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've got first class. I didn't pay for it, but, but you know what? That was a mistake. I should have said no. Because now, every time I get on my Southwest flight, I think, man, <laughs> first class sure would be nice, you know. It just made me more discontent that I actually had first class one time. I don't get to get it again. But then it gets worse. On a lot of flights, you know these little magazines they have in the pockets of the seats? Sky Mall. <laughs> Any of you read those? A lot of times when I'm just, you know, on a flight or something like that, I like to read. And sometimes if I didn't bring what I was thought to bring to read, I'll pull out a Sky Mall and I'll start looking at it. And it's just full of stuff after stuff, thing after thing after thing that is way overpriced stuff that you don't need in your life at all. But boy, does it look attractive in the magazine, Right? And I start looking at a Sky Mall magazine, and I start thinking, well, I can use that. That might be nice. All I really need is this ashtray and this lamp and this, you know, mag uh, that's all I really need. And then I'll be all right. I, I, and, and sure, I need a robot. Wouldn't that be great to have a robot? You know, all this stuff that they try to convince you that would make your life so much better if you just had these things. To be honest, 
If we were really pushed on what it would take to make us content, most of us would describe something like that. We need more of something. We would describe a change in circumstance or a change in our situation and say, that's what I need to be content. But did you hear what Paul said in verse 12? I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Listen, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I've learned the secret of being content either way. He's not saying it's evil to have plenty. He's not saying it's evil if you're in want. He's saying there is a secret to being content either way. And that neither one of those things will make you naturally content in and of themselves. Wouldn't it be good to know the secret? Well, Paul is going to share it with us here. He says this contentment thing can be there in any and every situation, which means it's an intrinsic, intrinsic thing. It's not an outward thing. It's an inward thing. It's something you have in you that can allow you to be content no matter what the circumstances. It doesn't come and go based on the size of your bank account or the mechanical reliability of your car or the strength of the stock market or the housing market. It's not based on the prognosis that the doctor gave you or the shape of your body right now. These are all outward things that can never produce contentment. The secret is there's something else. There's an inward thing. So here's the question. If it comes from within... If it's something that we learn, then what are the lessons we need to learn in order to have this contentment that can be found in any and every situation? Well, I think it's here for us in chapter 4. Let's look at verse 10 of chapter 4. Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. That's lesson number one right there. If you want contentment, no matter what, you have to learn to rejoice in the Lord. That's the first lesson to learn. That's been the theme of the whole book of Philippians, hasn't it? If you've been here for this series, you know the theme. If you haven't been, you can go to our website. We've posted the messages there. You can catch up and see how Paul, over and over again, has not just suggested, he's commanded us, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. It's a command from God. You know why? Because he wants us to have the joy of contentment in our lives. And it begins with learning to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord, I can be content in any and every situation. But it requires discipline to do that. If I will be disciplined enough to look out the window of that train and see all the ways God is blessing me, has blessed me in the past, is blessing me now, promises to bless me in the future, if I will take note of His grace and His forgiveness and the promise of eternal life that we have in Christ, then I can't help but rejoice, no matter what the circumstances of my life. I need to remember that, to rejoice in the Lord. I need to be disciplined enough in my life to remind myself daily to rejoice in the Lord. Friends, I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve what Jesus did for me on the cross. I don't deserve the price that was paid for me. I never have. I was his enemy. I was in rebellion against him when he did that for me, and so were you. We need to remember that. When we let the things of this world keep us from being content, we need to remember how God values every one of us. So much so that Jesus would die for us on that cross. And that should cause us to rejoice every time we think of it. Every time we remember it. That's why I love being pastor of a church where we come around this table every Sunday. If you haven't thought about it all week, hopefully at least on Sunday, you are being reminded of the price God was willing to pay for you and your sins. And I rejoice in God's love for me and in God's love for you. So let me ask you something. When's the last time you did this? Well, you just listed the blessings that come from God that you have in your life right now. Here's what the scripture says. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. So if there's anything good about your life at all, the source is God. That's where it came from. And if you can remember that, it helps you to rejoice in the Lord, that you have that good. It's time to stop just singing, count your many blessings, and we need to actually physically do it. We need to stop and write it down, make a list of the actual blessings that God has given us in our lives. And what that will do is it will change your perspective on whatever the situation is that was robbing you of your contentment. 
and you realize you have reason to rejoice in the Lord. Many years ago, there was a missionary that wrote about their return from the island of Tobago. She had worked with a leper colony there, and on the evening before she came back to the United States, she led that leper colony in a time of worship. And when she asked them, is there anyone here who has a favorite song they would like to sing, a fingerless hand was raised in the back row. And a woman with no ears and no nose, a woman whose lips were gone, said, could we sing, count your many blessings? Maybe that puts it a little in perspective for you and for me. That even in that circumstance, she wanted to thank God for the blessings she had in her life. Well, Paul goes on in verse 10 and he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And then he says this in verse 11. I think this is interesting. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. The first time I read that, it kind of took me back a little bit. I, I was thinking from a worldly perspective, wait a minute, Paul, you are in need. I mean, you remember where Paul is when he writes this? You remember that he's under arrest, that he's chained to a guard, he has no freedom at all? You remember that he's wasting away under arrest, not being able to do what he thought God had called him to do, to go out and preach and share the gospel with the Gentile world, and here he is having to stay locked up to this guard? You realize that he's there under pretenses of never being charged with a crime, he's being held unjustly? You remember that he's waiting uh, for a trial that may or may not happen because no date has been set for a trial? You remember that even if he did get a trial, it may be that he's condemned to die and he's got no ability to defend himself? In that system, if you didn't have uh, the ability to bribe the the leaders, the government leaders at that time, you probably weren't going to get out of this very well at all. And he didn't have the money or the resources to even offer a bribe. Here he is not knowing what's going to happen to him. From a worldly perspective... Paul was in need, wasn't he? But he is able to say under those conditions, I'm not saying this because I had any needs. He didn't see himself as being a man in need under those circumstances. Isn't that amazing? Man, that's a secret I want to know. That even under those circumstances, you're not seeing yourself as somebody in great need. I'm thinking, yes, you are, Paul. Man, if I was sitting there locked up to a guard, I'd say, God, I need you to do something here. I need you to make this right. I need you to get me out of this. I need you to provide money for me. I need you to provide a way for me to get out of this. That's what I'd be saying, most likely, in the flesh, under those conditions. Maybe you can relate to that a little bit. Maybe you're going through something right now, and that's the way you're approaching God with what you're going through. Instead of, I really don't need anything, I already have everything that I need. Well, I think the reason Paul can do this is that he's learned the secret. And one of the things I think is part of the secret that Paul has learned is he's learned not to compare himself and his life with what is happening in other people's lives. Because nothing robs us of contentment quicker than comparisons. So here's lesson number two. If you want to have joy in your life, stop comparing. Just stop it. Now, stop comparing your life to other people. The same Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Paul says, comparing your life to other people's lives is not a wise thing to do, period. Here's the thing that makes it unwise. Our tendency is always to compare up, not to compare down. You know what I'm talking about? We compare up, not down. 
Now, I've had the privilege of going to some third world countries and, and sharing the gospel there and, and serving uh, people there. And what happens when I do that is uh, I get knocked back into reality when, when I've been comparing myself with people comparing up. I get to see that I am in a position where I could also compare down, right? There are a lot of people that don't have anything like what I have. You could compare down. But our tendency is to compare up. And when we compare up, you never stay content very long. When compared to people who have more in some way than you do or you think are better off in some way than you are, the problem with that is it will always rob you of your contentment. Here's the problem. There's always someone who has more, better, newer than what you have. Always. There always will be, no matter how hard you work or what you achieve. So if we keep comparing up, it creates these feelings of discontentment. We may be happy, but you see somebody you think is happier. You may be pretty attractive, but you always find somebody you think is more attractive than you are. You may have money, but there's always somebody with more money. Always. And it will always leave you discontented if you go through your life comparing like that. Always. There was a study that was done several years back, and Newsweek reported on it. People were asked, what would it take to make you happy, to make you satisfied with your life? And almost all of them talked about money and having more money. Here's what they said. They found that people who made an average of 25000 a year said that they would be content if they could make 50000 a year. But then they asked people who made around 50000 a year, and they said they would be happy and content if they made 100000 a year. But guess what? They asked people that were making 100000 a year, guess what they said? Well, they would be happy and content if they made 200000 a year. And it was the same all the way through. At any level, they ask. No matter where they were, they thought if I made just twice as much, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. Then I'd be satisfied. But no matter what level they were on, it was never enough. Ever. So Paul resists comparing to other people. Listen to verse 12. Again, in its entirety. He says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the thing. Paul speaks from experience on both sides of the tracks. He had been on both ends of those extremes. You see, he was raised, according to Scripture and what we know about his life, it seems that he was raised by a pretty affluent family. He had the best of educations for his day and time, learned under the greatest teachers. He was on the fast track to leadership among his people. He was seen as a real up-and-comer, right? And then he came to know Jesus, and he gave his life to the Lord, and you would think, all right, things are only going to get better for Paul now. But just the opposite happened. Now, because of following Jesus, because of preaching in the name of Jesus, he has lost everything, and he's in prison, and not knowing if he's going to be executed or not. You see the role reversal? And he said, but I've learned to be content either way. I've had plenty, a lot of my life. And now I don't have plenty, and I'm still content. That's an amazing secret to learn, isn't it? What an amazing place to get to in life. And he wants to be clear in this fact. You may have a lot of money. You may have a little. But that's not really what contentment is about. Because if you have little now and you're not content, guess what? You're not going to be content when you have a lot either. That's just the truth. And some of you are thinking, I'd like to give it a shot. (laughs) I know. I know that feeling. But friends, if that's where you're looking for your contentment, that's not going to do it. Now, there's nothing evil about having more. If you do get blessed with more, thank God for it. But don't look to that as how you're going to be content in your life. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter if you have a lot or a little. So here's the third lesson, something we've got to learn to have the joyful life God wants us to have. We've got to realize what does it work so we don't waste our time chasing after those things. We have to realize what does it work when we want to have contentment in our lives. If material possessions, if external things could bring us contentment in life, then we should be the most content people on the planet as Americans. 
Because we have more stuff as Americans than any people on the face of the earth. And yet we're still some of the most discontented people in the world. Now we're not the only people that are blessed in the world. Others have stuff too. But overall as a nation, we've got more stuff than any other nation in the world. And we're still discontented as a people. According to the most recent census that was done, 76% of poor households in America, that's poverty level or below, have air conditioning. 76%. Do you realize how many places in the world where nobody has air conditioning still exist? Many places in the world. They've never had air conditioning. And 76% of the people we call poor in America have air conditioning. Only 30 years ago, only 36% of the entire U.S. population had air conditioning. Did you realize how quickly that's changed? And how much we take it for granted now that you're supposed to have that and expect to have that? In just 30 years, we've gotten so spoiled that we think that's almost a necessity. Way back in 1973, I know it's back before some of your time here, all right? Way back in 1973, the average size of a house being built in America was less than 1,500 square feet. Today, the average size house being built in America is just over 2,800 square feet. And we're still the most discontented people I've ever seen. Isn't it amazing that with all the improvements in the amount of stuff and size of stuff and wealth of stuff that we have. It has not kept us content. There's a good reason for that. In Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10, Solomon shares it with us. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. If that's what you're looking to for contentment, it will always be lacking and meaningless. It will never satisfy. It's not evil. It just can't do for you what you're trying to get it to do for you. That's all. It can't give you the contentment that you're thinking it's going to give you if you could just have it. You know, when I did visit some of those third world countries, when I went to the Dominican Republic and the remote areas there, there's some wealth there, but there's a lot of poor areas there. I went across into Haiti where there's even less wealth and more poverty been to Ecuador, and there's some wealthy areas of Ecuador, but there's some poverty-stricken areas too. So Anna and I went to a remote village in China where they had almost none of the modern conveniences that we think of today. When I've gone to those places, before I got there, you know what I expected? I expected to find people that were miserable in their poverty. But you know what I found instead? Some of the most joyous people I've ever been around. See, I visited with churches there, and I was able to teach and preach at churches in those poverty-stricken places. And the people in those churches were the most rejoicing people I've ever been around. You see, they learned the secret that we here in America have such a hard time grasping. But the last few times I've been able to do that, you know what I've noticed? I've noticed that things are changing. You know what's changing them? They're becoming less and less joyful and less and less grateful. You know what's changing it? the internet they now started getting access to the internet and as soon as they got access to the internet you know what they were able to see all the other people who have so much more than they have all the stuff that they have that we have that they don't have and it's stirring up discontentment even among those people because now they're comparing now they can compare before they couldn't but now they can compare what life is like for some compared to what their life is like now. And now they're becoming more and more discontent just like we are. I was amazed though the first few times. How could they be content without some of the stuff we just take for granted? Without water right there anytime you want it. Without air conditioning. Without pizza that you can just order and have delivered to your house. Without, without a hot shower ever. Like, could I be content myself without any of those things? It's a secret we need to learn, friends. We've got to ask ourselves, are material blessings really the source of contentment? 
Or they're not blessings if you look to them for contentment. I can tell you that. They're not blessings at all. They're just going to keep you from being content if you are looking at them for your contentment. I think eventually we all recognize that this is the truth. But unfortunately, we have to learn it the hard way, don't we? We have to learn it by experience. We have to try it out for ourselves. So we waste a lot of time and energy of our lives pursuing those things just to check it out for ourselves to see if it really would bring us contentment or not. We kind of take Solomon's approach that he writes about in Ecclesiastes. It's like there's a big buffet in front of us and we think, well, I'm going to take my plate and I'm going to go try this off the buffet and see if that works. Or if that doesn't work, then I'll try that. And if that doesn't work, then I'll try that. We keep going after all these things thinking one of them might bring us contentment. So we grab a plate and we look over and we think, well, maybe success and achievement would make me content. So we, we put in a lot of hours and a lot of effort, and we reach this achievement. Maybe it's graduation. Maybe you got that degree this weekend. Maybe you got something you've been looking for and working for and longing for for a long time. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But here's the problem. If you were thinking that's going to bring contentment that lasts in your life, here's the problem with it. It won't be long before that degree can't satisfy you anymore. It can't make you content, even though you want it to. And then you think, well, if it's not that, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's money. If I just find the job where I can make a lot of money, after all, that's the American dream, right? Get the right job. Make a lot of money. Be able to buy anything you want. Then you'll be content. And you work hard and you start making more money. And you start buying the stuff that you know you could get with the money. And some of us don't even wait till we have the money. That's why we've got the debt problem. We buy all the stuff. And boy, the stuff makes you happy for a little while, doesn't it? But after a while, the stuff begins to get a little old a little worn, and it's not fulfilling you anymore. And there's always more stuff, more stuff. And it's just this constant chasing after the more stuff, and you're not feeling content. Maybe it's the house or the neighborhood that you always wanted to live in or the car that you always wanted to have. And, and those don't do it very long. And then we grab another plate and we think, well, maybe it's, it's relationships. Maybe it's a romantic relationship. Maybe it's the right person. Maybe it's the right woman, the right man. If I just find the right one and I get married, then I can be content. And so you chase after that. And you, you maybe compromise what you thought that God wants you to have. But you want to get married so bad you're willing to, to, to make the compromise. And you get into a relationship thinking that will make you content. And, and you're happy you know, the wedding day is so joyous, it's so much fun, you're so happy, and you go back and look at the pictures, and they're so beautiful, but the reality of the marriage is not quite what you thought. And again, you're not content anymore. And then you try everything you're hungry for, thrills, entertainment, sex, whatever it is, surely something's going to satisfy me. And you keep going back to the buffet with another plate, trying one more thing. It's like your Thanksgiving dinner. You know what it's like. You sit down at a table with your family and your friends and you just gorge yourself. You eat more in one sitting than, than you ever do any of the rest of the year. And you, you get up from the table, you waddle over to the lazy boy and you, you recline back in the lazy boy. You loosen your belt and you say something like this, I'm so full, I'm never going to eat again. And you doze off. And you wake up an hour later and say, hmm, turkey sandwich sounds good. <laughs> right? Because it didn't satisfy very long, did it? You can fill up on that stuff and still be totally discontent with your life. So what is the secret? Where is contentment found? Well, Paul gives it to us. It's lesson number four here. It's learning that Jesus is enough. It's finally learning the lesson that Jesus is enough. And he's the only thing, the only one that is. It's kind of interesting that pretty much every message in this series has had the same conclusion. How do you have hope? In Jesus. How do you have the right relationships? It's found in Jesus. How do you have joy? It's found in Jesus. Where do you find humility? In Jesus. Where do you find compassion? It's in Jesus. The answer is always what? Jesus. It's kind of like when you ask your kids after church, what did they learn in their class? Even if they haven't paid attention at all, they know the right answer. We learned about Jesus today. <laughs> right? 
They know that's the right answer every time. You can't argue with that, right? There is a sense in which I feel like, well, some of you are going to think Pastor Randy is making it sound too simple. Right? The answer is Jesus. Doesn't that sound simple? It is that simple. That doesn't mean it's easy. I'm just saying it is simple. We make it way more complicated than it has to be, than it ever should have been, than it ever will be. It's not that complicated, friends. There's only one source that satisfies completely for eternity. And his name is Jesus. That's why Paul puts it this way in verse 13. I can do all this through him, speaking of Jesus, who gives me strength. He is the all in all. He is the one source. All the other stuff on the buffet is so temporary in the satisfaction that it brings. Only Jesus satisfies completely. He's learned that contentment is not found in anything out there. It's found in this inner strength that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the only one who truly satisfies. So he talks to this church in Philippi on contentment. And the word he uses when he says, I've learned to be content, is a surprising word for the church people. Because he borrows a word, you might say he steals a word from a pagan philosophy that he uses for contentment here. He steals a word from Stoicism. The followers of the philosophy of Stoicism were called Stoics. And the Stoics had this philosophy about how to be content in life. And maybe you've heard the term Stoicism and you weren't quite sure you know, of its origin or where it came from. Well, it came from these people in Paul's day who were called the Stoics. And they had some things that they taught that were the pathway to contentment. The well, first thing they said you had to do to be content was eliminate all emotion. That emotion is really what keeps you from being content. You get all emotional about stuff. You get emotionally attached to people or places or things. And you need to get rid of that emotional attachment to the stuff. In other words you got to make yourself not care about anything. Now, today we try to do that through recreational drugs. But back then, they were saying it was a mental exercise where you just make yourself not care about anything. And if you don't care about anything, then nothing upsets you anymore, and therefore then you can be content, right? What a great way to live life. Not caring about anything, not being emotionally attached to anybody or anything. That way nothing destroys your peace. Somebody dies, I don't care. Somebody's sick, I don't care. Somebody's struggling, I don't care. You have to just learn not to care. That's not what God teaches about contentment. That's not what Paul said. In fact, Paul said in verse 19, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. He wants us to care about needs being met, about people being cared for, about God's provision for people's lives. He wants us to care about that. It gives us purpose. It gives us reason to do what we do. And that brings joy and contentment to our lives. Well, the Stoics taught something else. If you want to be content, they taught that you have to just accept everything as your fate. you got no control over anything. Whatever happens, happens. I love the phrases people use today. Well, it is what it is. Well, duh. What else could it be, right? <laughs> of course it is what it is. But they say it in a way that means not much you can do about it. Life just happens to you. Everything just is what it is. That's stoicism. And you don't really have any input, any influence. But that's not what Paul taught. Remember last week in Philippians 4, we looked at a passage where he told us, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. In other words, you are involved in this. You're part of the process. You need to take the action that God's called on you to take if you want to have a contented life. You do have influence over your contentment by the choices that you make and the places you put your trust and your concern. Of course you are involved in this. It's not just what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. Well, another part of this false belief system was you have to eliminate all desire. I mean, after all, if you don't ever desire anything, you won't ever be disappointed, right? I mean, just lower your expectations so low that you never expect anything, and that way you're never disappointed, and you can always be content then. Man, what a great life, right? <laughs> Just lower your expectations so much that you'll never be disappointed. Don't have any desires. But Paul didn't say to live without desires. That wasn't the secret. In fact, 
He taught us that the only thing that would satisfy the desires you do have, and God put them there, is God himself. God put the desires in you to be fulfilled in him. That's where he wants you to have those desires met. You see, all of the things on the buffet line that we try to find satisfaction in, they all accomplish something. Even though they fail to satisfy, here's what they accomplish. They create a hunger and a thirst in us. When we find them to be lacking, we still have a hunger, don't we? We still have a thirst. You know what that does? God wants to use that to draw us to Him. To come to the living water. That if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. To come to the bread of life. Who gives life and gives it more abundantly. God wants that hunger and thirst that you feel to draw you to Him. So that He can show you that He is the source that satisfies. Friends, I'm convinced that living in 2016 is one of the hardest times in the world, in the history of the world, for us to find contentment. Because there are so many other options out there. There are so many other things calling us, drawing us to, away from God to, to try those things. And when we try them, they satisfy temporarily. And so because we're getting temporary satisfaction occasionally, it keeps us from trying the real thing, the one who can truly satisfy So we put it off temporarily, a little bit at a time. We find a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of contentment, but it's not lasting. That's why I love what Mother Teresa said. She said, you will never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. You'll never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. She left everything to go serve the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, She knew she wasn't going to have the things of this world in that place. And that's where she found her contentment that she had never known before. So here's the question for us all. It all comes down to this. If Jesus was all you had, right now, right here, would he be enough for you? Would Jesus be enough? There was an elderly missionary that gave his testimony. He was returning from the foreign mission field, and he had been there for 30 years, coming back to the U.S. He hadn't been here in that long, and he had a daughter that lived here. He was coming back home here in the States to live out the rest of his days with his daughter. His flight landed in California, and then he had to ride a bus from there. And the bus had a stopover, a layover in Las Vegas. And he got a hotel room there in Las Vegas. He got there late at night. He checked into the hotel. And he decided to go out and walk down the strip of Las Vegas. He had never been there. It was almost midnight, but it was like it was broad daylight. You know how all the lights are there? It's all just so well lit. They don't ever want you to think about it being nighttime. They want you to stay up gambling all night. So they keep everything really brightly lit. He's walking down the streets of Las Vegas. And he sees all the sights. I mean, everything this world has to offer You can find it on the strip in Las Vegas, right? He walks down the strip and he sees the bright lights. He hears the loud music, the amazing hotels. He walks through a car show that has the most amazing cars he's ever seen. He sees the games being played in the casinos, the money on the table going in and out, the money coming in and out of the slot machines. He sees the marquees announcing the amazing entertainers, the amazing shows that are being offered. He sees all the drink specials, the signs announcing all the amazing food in the restaurants. He sees all the scantily clad women that are there to entertain. He sees the best this world can offer held up on a platter. And eventually he goes back to his room in the hotel. And he doesn't turn on the lights in his room. Instead, he walked over to the window and he opened up the curtains. And he looked down at the lights of Las Vegas. And he looked up and saw the lights of the heavens. And he saw how much more glorious those lights were. And he prayed this prayer. God, I thank you that tonight I haven't seen anything that I want more than I want you. And he gave his testimony. As he gave it, he sang this song. 
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. If you're here today hungering and thirsting, I want to offer you Jesus. He is the living water. He's the bread of life. This world can't offer you anything that can give you the contentment, the joy that you can find in Jesus. Maybe there's just one here today that's searching, that's hungry, that's thirsty. We offer you Jesus. But it's not just about accepting Jesus. Friends, it's about surrendering to Jesus. Giving your life to Him. Trusting that He will, in turn, satisfy you completely. As we stand and sing today, we invite you to come to Jesus.